Hello and welcome to a lecture on Module 3 of Enterprise Networking Security and Automation. Uh, this will be on networking security concepts. My name is Kelly Caldwell and I'm the lead instructor at the Instructor Training Center at Stanley Community College. Uh, we're a large Cisco Networking Academy in North Carolina. And I want to go ahead and give you my normal disclaimer and that is this is a just good enough video. I do not try to make perfect videos. I would not be perfect if you were in the classroom with me and I was trying to stand in front of you and lecture. And therefore, I'm not going to try to be perfect in a video. This will be a, my phone will ding. Uh, the phone in my office may ring. Someone may come to my door and we'll pause and then we will move forward. So this is uh, just trying to get you a good introduction to this, the concepts in the, in the class. Obviously, I strongly suggest if you're not already in, in, in a Cisco Networking Academy, that you take the time to find a local Cisco Networking Academy, get involved in it. Uh, take classes, get your certifications, and begin a wonderful career in information technology. So we're going to start with this particular chapter on network security concepts. And I'll, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time. This is a pretty long module. And the module pulls a lot of different things from different classes that we've had in the past in the CCNA. In fact, some of this, if you've been in the Networking Academy before, some of this material that you will see has been in the introduction to cybersecurity, cybersecurity essentials, CCNA security, CCNA cyber ops, um, I will even say that if you've had a Security Plus class, 99% of what you're going to see in Module 3 is simply review of that material. So uh, we're going to look at some of the, what's going on in cybersecurity, some of the threat actors, malware, some common network attacks, um, some things we call technology configuration and protocols, uh, or people, actually technology configuration people, some of the different ways that uh, you can get into a network, then TCP and UDP vulnerabilities. On down through cryptography, which by the way, I always tell people there's nothing in information technology that's rocket science that just someone with good common sense who wants to learn can't do, except for cryptography. Um, now the common and basic things we'll look at in this chapter are not super deep, but if you get into building cryptographic algorithms, then uh, you're gonna need a math background, a very strong math background. But for most of what we do, you don't need that strong of a math background. There's a quick, Ethical hacking statement here that basically says jail is bad. Um, so, you know, you learn about these different things in cybersecurity. And just remember that you don't want to try any of the techniques that you learn in your ethical hacking classes on any system that you don't have permission to get into. So please be aware of that. So what's the current state of affairs in cybersecurity? Well, the biggest thing, honestly, is that everything is online now. And so we have both external and internal threats. And the external threats are threats that are trying to get in from outside of our networks through our firewalls. Internal threats are, could be someone who's literally been sent to work in your company and then they'll try to exfiltrate data. Uh, it could be uh, a person who you passed over a, for, a, for a, a job position or a raise or whatever. So these two types of threats. And you also hear, um, external and you hear um, structured and unstructured threats. So you can have external structured threats um, and that's someone who's trying to break into your network from the outside for a very specific purpose. You can have unstructured external threats and that's someone who's just maybe rattling uh, the door handle, so to speak, or running ping, ping suites or port suites to try to see if they can get into your network. And then you have unstructured internal threats and structured internal threats. And those are, again, and unstructured, it could be someone you sent to an ethical hacking class who's uh, running Kali Linux on the inside of your network and just, again, rattling door handles to see what they can get into. And they could accidentally destroy data and not even mean to do it. Um, and then you have structured internal threats, which is similar to what happened to Cisco, quite honestly. They had someone who was uh, hired by them working in their engineering group who copied the iOS data and then exfiltrated it to a foreign national, uh, foreign country. So. Those are the types of threats that can go on. Now, I think the big thing is that because everything is, is so ingrained into a network world now that the threat's bigger because we have so much of our life on the internet and on digital devices. I think one of the things that you really need to think about, we, we put so much effort into defending our networks, but we also need to think about defending our phones. Think about how much information you have on your phone and how much that is now just another computer that you keep with you, that you do all kinds of things on. So I think that's a big issue that we need to, uh, to look at. It's really not even talked about in this particular uh, module. 
By the way, sometimes I'll say chapter. That's because it used to be chapters in the old CCNA 6. They're now modules, and typically modules are shorter than chapters, although this is a fairly long module, to be quite honest. So data loss, I'll let you look at that, but the idea that, um, by the way, data loss doesn't just mean someone stealing your data and taking it. I, I could, you know, if I had a dollar for every time a student has walked in my office and said, well, my USB is dry, drive has died and I lost X, Y, Z, and I say, well, where's your backup? And they go, I don't have a backup. Or someone calls and says, hey, my laptop's crashed and I had all my baby pictures on it. Well, where's your backup? I don't have a backup. Folks, <laughs> data loss happens. Drives will fail. USB drives will fail. Um, so make sure you've got backups. I, I really strongly recommend things like uh, online backups. Um, um, there's multiple ones out there. We use uh, several different ones that in, in my areas. But, you know, if it's as simple as just copying it to your Google Drive or, you know, using um, Carbonite to, to automatically have a drive copied up to the Internet, make sure that you're backing your data up. I do like these two, by the way. These are um, at the end of each little module section. There's a check your understanding. So make sure you're making use of those because they are kind of neat. So what are hackers out there? There are different types. There are white hat hackers, and those are ethical hackers who hack to find the vulnerabilities and then use those, uh, that information to help secure systems. There's gray hat hackers who skirt the bounds. Okay, so they don't necessarily always do it for personal gain. They may do it just to make themselves famous. They may do it, and they may, you know, at one minute, a gray hat could be working as a white hat hacker one week and a black hat hacker another week. So these are the folks kind of in the middle. Black hat hackers, those are the unethical, unethical criminals who are trying to get into computer networks and compromise it. Now, people wonder why people would become hackers, but let's think about this. It's a whole lot better to be a hacker than a bank robber. Um, there's a lot less chance when you're hacking into a computer system you're gonna get shot. Whereas if you go rob a bank, there's always a chance a police officer could be nearby and you could be shot. Um, so you've also got very skilled individuals who've learned that this is an easy way to get money. And honestly, if it's not above $5,000, typically the government officials will not even try to prosecute. So if they could you know, skim off X amount of money below 5,000 for a different, uh, hacks and they're in the clear pretty much. So um, it, it's, it's definitely something that's interesting. And we have seen an evolution of our hackers from just script kiddies, people who are running uh, pre-made uh, pre Metasploit uh, modules, to people all the way up to state sponsored. And in fact, I would say that the biggest change I've seen during my time in the world of networking and computer security is that we now are dealing with state sponsored hacking groups. They are military groups. They are um, literally supported by the governments of the world, uh, and they are being used not just for attacking foreign countries. For instance, uh, when Georgia was invaded several years ago, <clears throat> quote, Russian hackers who were not part of the government took down uh, the communication networks inside of Georgia before the invasion. Well, really, we know that was the government doing it, let's be quite honest. Um, we have to pretty much say that we, you know, the United States has to take credit for um, taking out the centrifuges in Iran. That's something we 99.9% we, .9 we did or the Israelis did. Um, the other item though is you've got countries like China who are using their state-sponsored uh, hacking groups to not only further their agenda, but to further their corporation's agenda. So they're doing corporate espionage through state-sponsored um, hacking groups or black hat hackers. So it, that to me is one of the biggest changes we've seen. Um, and you know, even to the point now to where uh, it is technically officially considered an act of war to hack into another government's systems. It'd be an interesting place to see where we go uh, in the future with these. Here's a quick video on threat actor tools, but pretty much what has happened back in the old days, uh, you know, back in 1985, uh, old, old days, showing my age here, uh, you had to have a great deal of technical knowledge and the, the tech tools were pretty unsophisticated. In other words, you had to have command line knowledge, you had to really understand the systems, unless you were like Kevin Mitnick and were just really good at social engineering. But as we've moved up, you'll see that the tech tools have become much easier where you can literally just you want to buy a botnet, go buy your botnet and do a denial of service attack on someone. 
um, you can do that now on the dark web pretty easily. So different tools, password crackers, John the Ripper, uh, wireless hacking tools like Kismet, Firesheet, NetStumbler, all the way down, I'm not gonna read all these out, but vulnerability scanners, Kali Linux, which is a white hat security tool that can obviously, anything that's white hat can be used to be black hat. I tell people this all the time, you know, a baseball bat uh, is a wonderful thing to be able to use to hit baseballs. It can also be used to hit people over the head. Um, the same thing can be said for Kali Linux. Kali Linux and different uh, versions of, of Linux-based hacking penetration testing tools are excellent tools to be used by white hat hackers and they're excellent tools to be used by black hat hackers. So, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why when we talked about this particular chapter, we talked about making sure that you're doing this for the right reason. Be a white hat hacker because jail is bad. What is malware? Well, there's all different types of malware. There can be a virus. And by the way, a virus is a form of malware that typically has to be um, moved by human intervention. In other words, you have to either move a flash drive from one machine to another. The difference between a virus and a worm is a worm can infect other systems on its own, whereas a virus requires uh, human action to propagate. And then a Trojan horse is um, something that appears to be one thing, but is another. It's based on the old uh, Trojan horse myth, technically maybe a myth, we're not absolutely sure, uh, from uh, prehistory where a large horse full of soldiers was given, put out in front of the, the walls of Troy, pulled into uh, the city, and then the, the Greek soldiers jumped out and took the city. Um, I'm really surprised we don't see more Trojan horses, especially on phones for like free apps. Kids today will download every free game they can and they have the attention span of a spider monkey. Um, so they're downloading multiple different games. So I'm amazed that we don't see more Trojan, horse by, uh, Trojan horses uh, as malware in our systems. Now, um, I'm not gonna spend time looking at boot sector firmware and all these, but one of the big things I will tell you about some viruses that are very dangerous are viruses that are being loaded into the BIOS or the UFI of systems. Um, if you can ever infect the UFI or the, and it's very hard to do there, but the BIOS of a, of a system, um, basically the, the operating system, even if you're running antivirus, will have no clue whatsoever that anything is on the system. So adware, ransomware, rootkits, all of these things, there's a program called Malware Bytes that can help with some of these adware and ransomware. Um, ransomware is, 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 is something that's really on the rise because what people will do is get access to your systems, um, encrypt all your files, and then ask you to pay. And if you don't pay, then you they won't unencrypt your, your system. Uh, always keep an offline backup. That's one of the big things there that's important. Okay, moving forward, some common network attacks. Reconnaissance attack, this is when you just uh, do ping sweeps, you do port scans, you run vulnerability assessments like Nessus, uh, Nipper, um, you're trying to find any known, known vulnerabilities. And then once you know those vulnerabilities, then the reconnaissance step is just finding out what can be attacked. And then after that, we're going to actually go into the access attack. We're gonna then execute on the information we gain in the reconnaissance attack. One of the things people don't realize, it's very easy just do an internet query. Just Google the target. You'd be amazed the amount of information you can find by Googling a target. Ping sweeps, port scans, all of those are different things a threat actor can do. Send out port scans to find out, that, hey, guess what, port 20 and 21 are open, so we know these machines are running uh, FTP or any of the others. SMTP, whatever here. In this case, we see that SSH is open, DNS is open, uh, RPC bind, IPP, which is the internet printing protocol, I do believe, and RNDC uh, are all open. Yep, that's a printing protocol of CUPS. Once we have the reconnaissance, we then create our password attacks. We, we can do a password attack. Um, there's a lot of debate on lockout mechanisms on passwords for logins. You know, if you say after three login attempts, you were gonna lock you out indefinitely, well, guess what? I could create a uh, script that will go in and attempt with all your user accounts to log in with incorrect passwords and lock everybody in your network out. Um, so that's a, that's a rough 
that'd be a rough day at the office without doubt. Um, the other thing is most people know that passwords are not very secure, even if you use a secure password. We're seeing much more movement now to what we call multi-factor authentication. In other words, you not only need the password, but you also need possibly a code that is texted to your phone or sent to your email. Um, if you can in any way enable multi-factor authentication, always do that. Uh, for instance, your debit card at the bank has multi-factor authentication because you have to have the card, something you have, and you must know your PIN, something you know. Uh, and we talk a lot about different things, something you have, like a card, something you know, like a password, and then something you are, which is biometric authentication. So the ability to look at a phone and have it log in with your face or fingerprints or whatever. Other types of attacks are spoofing attacks, and this is where we um, try to do things such as trust exploitation. In other words, if system A is trusted by system B, then all we have to do is um, break into system A, and then we can have a, um, we can take that trust relationship and we can exploit it so that we can get into system B or vice versa. Port direction, port redirection. We can basically say uh, that we're a compromised host and we can appear to be someone else, and so we become sitting in the middle of port of a of a um, of a conversation, which is more like this man in the middle. This is what you would try to do if you were a hacker and you were sitting at Starbucks and people were trying to get into the Starbucks wireless network. You'd want your laptop to appear to be the wireless access point, and then they would connect to you, and then you would be sitting in the middle grabbing everything. And then there's buffer overflow attacks, and this is where um, the programs, a program has not been written correctly, and you send a large amount of information into a possibly a password field or something to cause unexpected behavior. It could cause the machine to crash, or many times if the program's not been written correctly, uh, it will dump you into a protected part of memory, and then that will give you root access or give you elevated privilege access that you can exploit. And then folks, a lot of times you don't need a whole lot of technical knowledge at all. You just call and say, hey, my name's Bob, and uh, I need to talk, uh, we're, we're doing a survey on um, the use of networking equipment you're in, we're just trying to, we'd like to know what kind, of net, what kind of network equipment you have in your network. And you'd be amazed the number of people who would say, oh yeah, we use Cisco gear, we use you know, Juniper or Meraki or whatever. Boom, I just got a lot of the information I needed, at least to start to, to get into your network. Or I call and I say, hey, yeah, this is John at uh, John and IT, and we're, we're having to reset passwords, but I need to know your old password to be able to get in. And they go, well, I can't give you my password. And I go, well, look, hey, I, I'm just trying to do my job. Will you help me here? Something for something. Just help me, okay? I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in a bind. You're working here. I'm working here. I, I mean, COVID 19's got me going crazy. I'm working 14 hours a day. Just help me out. And that type of impersonation. Tailgating, when you walk in behind someone, shoulder surf, when you look over the top of their shoulder, or dumpster diving, just go to an area and uh, pull out all the stuff that's been thrown in the dumpster, it's not been shredded correctly. And this can get you an enormous amount of information. The other thing, honestly, if you really wanna, and it's, this is a social engineering attack with technical uh, things, take uh, technical parts, Take a USB drive, load your attack software on it, and sit it in an office. Make it a 32 gig USB drive. People will put that in their computer every single time. So, some best practices, never give out your username or credentials, never leave it anywhere it can be found. Don't open emails from untrusted sources. Do not put any information into the dumpster that you don't want to be common knowledge and never use work or work-related passwords. Also, folks, I would say have a multiple set of passwords. Uh, have a set of passwords that you use in one area and then a set of passwords in another area and then a super secure set you only use in one place. Now, what are denial of service attacks? DOS attacks are when you take and try to overwhelm a site or a network with um, traffic to make normal use impossible. So a denial of service attack would be a threat actor trying to send so many pings the server can't respond to anyone else. 
Now the problem is quite honestly, a single threat actor or a single machine would have a very hard time overwhelming most modern machines, most modern servers. So what they do is they go out and they get these DDoS attacks. They find a large number of infected computers and then they use those to attack a site. These are extremely difficult to stop because the zombies or these botnets could be in multiple different places. So I can't just say I'm gonna block all traffic from California because I may have legitimate customers in California. Plus the botnet may be in California, China, France, you know, Africa. And so all those machines could be coming in from different areas. And if I'm a normal bank and I have customers in all those areas, I can't just block that traffic. So a denial of service attack is extremely, especially a distributed denial of service attack, it's extremely hard to stop. So what are some common vulnerabilities? Well, in IPv4 and v6, we have ICMP tax, uh, attacks, and that is using uh, ICMP message protocols, uh, packets, echo packets to discover networks. In other words, we can use it for our reconnaissance. We can try to ping, and if the system responds, we know it's up. We can use address spoofing, man in the middle. We can do session hijacking. And we see here, the thing is, most people now block ICMP at the edge of their network, and that in some ways is good, but it also is bad because it breaks end-to-end -end reliability and end-to-end -end discoverability and connectivity. So um, ICMP is, is an, an interesting beast in that there's a lot of discussion about how we should best set up our external networks. Um, at the same time, most people filter it because they have to because it's been used for attacks so much. Here's an ampl amplification of this threat actor. I do an echo request, but I'm spoofing the source, which in this case is my victim. So I send an echo request to all of these machines on the internet, and they send an echo reply back to the victim. Well, the victim never sent it to begin with, and so now they're being overwhelmed by this reply traffic. And so at this point, the victim is the victim of a denial of service attack. We can also do uh, address spoofing. And uh, one of the biggest ways we do this is not only IP address spoofing, but MAC address spoofing, especially if you're inside of a network. Um, it's very, once someone's inside your network, even though we can use port security and that's one way to secure our ports, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But port security um, is a way to keep people from spoofing uh, MAC addresses. But it, it's still very difficult once someone is inside your network to stop them from being able to spoof certain things. Uh, and again, here's an, a, a switch cam table and your know, content addressable memory table is the MAC address to port um, mappings that are used by switches to, um, to keep up with what machines and what hosts are on what ports. In this case, uh, the host is spoofing the AABBCC of a legitimate server. Now what they would want to do is denial, do a denial of service attack or cause that machine to um, blue screen due to a buffer overflow or some sort. And then at this point, the switch thinks the threat actor is actually the host on the left here. Again, mitigation technique is use port security. If you do port security and have it to where the switch recognizes that on port one only AABBCC should be here. And as soon as it's seen on a different port, okay, then it can shut that port down or honestly shut the ports down. If the host, if a threat actor plugs into a port in your floor and that floor is, and that port is disabled, they can't spoof a MAC address. All right. Now, honestly, if they were to find the MAC address, spoof it, unplug this machine, then plug their machine in, very little you can do to stop that, um, other than look in your network and physically secure the ports so that someone cannot uh, plug into a, a server port especially. TCP, by the way, has some built-in uh, vulnerabilities. It is was never built with security in mind. Uh, it requires acknowledgement, so you can uh, 
When you send a TCP three-way handshake, a send, SENAC, and ACT. Uh, when you send a SEND, you expect a SENAC back, and if you don't get one back, you will be a half open connection. So there, you can cause a TCP flood, a SEND flood that can cause a machine to, to, to run out of um, what's called half open buffer space. There are other, the six fields inside of TCP, urge, act, push, reset, send, and fin. Those are the control bits, and those can be used to cause um, certain, the host to re reply with certain uh, information that can be used for reconnaissance. Here again is the three-way handshake because TCP expects reliable delivery. So before we ever send anything, we're gonna do a three-way handshake. We have flow control to make sure that both sides uh, by acting um, particular, particular sequence numbers, both sides can keep up with how much information is being sent and neither one is being overwhelmed. And it's a staple communication because when they're done sending, they will drop the uh, open session. So in this case, see a three-way handshake. So we see a send is sent from the host over to the other host, a send act, which takes the sequence number of the first host that put in a send, acts it by adding one to it and then sends its sequence number. The right host sends its sequence number. And then the left host will then send in the sequence saying 101, I saw your act, and I'm also gonna act your sequence number of 300. At this point, you have a fully open communication channel, TCP session between host on the left and the host on the right. With a send flood, the actor sends a Thread actor sends multiple send requests to a web server, but they never get a send act. It never comes back. And so the web server is waiting to complete that three way handshake. And if you send enough of them, you can fill up the buffer that it has in its half open connections. And it won't be able to re respond to any other send requests. Now we've got ways to mediate, mitigate this with our firewalls, um, dropping uh, half open connections after a very short amount of time. Um, but it's one of the ways we do it is actually is we have our firewalls look for enormous amounts of send requests and see that as a, an attack and then start to mitigate those. Another one is a reset attack. So you can terminate it. So even though there's a typically what happens is you have a fin, the fin received, you act it, then you send another fin and you act it, and then the, the session between A and B are dropped. Well, this can be used to also force us. Uh, a session to drop by spoofing that you are A sending a fin. UDP, a lot simpler. Uh, UDP is, you look at the whole header, you'll notice there's, it's unreliable, there's no flow control, no guaranteed delivery. Um, it's, you can't have flood attacks with UDP, but pr pretty much UDP is, um, I won't say it's any more any more secure access, probably less secure because you don't have the um, actual channel being created, but it is a little bit less um, susceptible to certain types of attacks simply because it doesn't have the mechanisms that can be used like TCP. Um, ARP. ARP is the process of mapping a, finding the MAC address from a known um, IP address. And one of the things you can do um, with ARP is, here's the normal process. You send out an ARP request, which is the broadcast, and the receiving host that has that IP address will send back its MAC address. You can poison the ARP cache. So in other words, you can respond for another host to make the local host. So for instance, if you're looking for the MAC address of 10.1, uh, the host down here can attempt the threat actor can attempt to say that it is 10.1, this the MAC address is um, this host instead of the actual R1's MAC address, and then it becomes a man in the middle, okay? And you can do spoofing of gratuitous requests. Again, I'm not gonna spend, let you, I'll let you look through this and read it yourself, but it, it all comes down to the threat actor using the ARP request process to feed in either a spoofed MAC address or an incorrect MAC address as a response so the packets will come to the threat actor instead of to the correct destination host. Now, DNS attacks are some of the scariest things out there, folks, and uh, they're difficult for us. 
Because when we put in www.microsoft.com or www.cisco.com, we expect to go to that site. Um, what many people don't realize is there's a host.txt file on your machine that on Windows is the first place checked for your DNS request. So you can actually go in and if you change that or if you hack a machine and change that file, that file will be, when you put in www.microsoft.com, you could send it to a spoof site. Um, that to me is one of the scariest things out there. The other thing is DNS was not designed to begin with um, to be secure. Um, and, you know, we look at a lot of us use 8888 or 88, I think it's 8844. It's the other one. Well, if someone compromised Google's DNS, then we would never know we weren't going to Microsoft or Cisco.com. We simply wouldn't know. The other thing I've, I've read a lot about that's kind of interesting and, and scary is that using DNS tunneling, in other words, everyone has to allow DNS because without it, we're not able to get, you know, the res we can't resolve fully qualified domain names to IP addresses. So using DNS queries and responses to actual, actually tunnel uh, botnet control traffic in and other things inside of it is a really scary thing. That's what this talks about here. So we basically take it and uh, tunnel non-DNS traffic inside of DNS traffic. And you can't write an access control list, which is one of our concepts coming up in module four. You can't write an ACL to block all of DNS because if you block DNS, you can't use a web browser. And so this takes a very smart firewall that can start digging down into the data being carried by your packets and determining, hey, why is this information, you know, DNS queries shouldn't have all this in the data portion. Um, and there are firewalls out there that can do that. Other items, DHCP attack, this is normal DHCP. Uh, I call it the good old Ant Dora. You have a DHCP discover, which is a broadcast, a DHCP offer, which is a unicast. So in other words, the client boots up and says, hey, I need an IP address, sends out the discover. The server sends back an offer and says, well, here you go, here's an IP address you can use. Client goes, that's a mighty fine looking IP address. Do you mind if I use it? And then finally, the DHCP server sends an ACK and says, yep, you can use it. Well, one of the things that we can do with DHCP is we can spoof. In other words, you can have a rogue DHCP server. You can have um, DHCP server exhaustion. In other words, you have a um, attack where you try to exhaust all the DHCP addresses on a segment. The way we mitigate this, by the way, is there's a thing called DHCP um, spoofing um, mitigation. Uh, we can actually set it up to where uh, only certain ports are allowed to send out DHCP offers. They're trusted uh, DHCP ports, and we're able to do that. Um, so there is a mitigation technique that lets you uh, stop DHCP spoofing attacks. All right, so some of our best practices. Obviously, we want to protect the confidentiality of our data. Only those who should see it should be able to see it. The integrity of the data, we don't want the data being changed in transit and the availability, the data needs to be available when people need to get to it. With our defense and depth approach, we try to create layers that are harder for um, hackers to get into. So we try to segment our network, we try to use VLANs, we try to use um, you know, security, email security appliances, web security appliances, we try to use AAA authentication. Obviously we use firewalls uh, to block on the, um, on the individual um, egress points of our networks, egress and ingress port, part, parts. We may use uh, intrusion prevention services. Um, you know, Cisco owns uh, Snort now, I believe. There's all different types of intrusion prevention uh, to try to figure out, hey, this looks like an attack, drop it. So content, Cisco email security appliance, uh, there's one you can actually is looking at all emails and trying to figure out, is this spam? Is it malware embedded? Is it a redirect attack. And so the ESA, basically your email server, sends all of its information up to the ESA and that appliance makes in, um, determinations about whether or not an email is a phishing email uh, or you know it's a legitimate email and send, lets it go in. And there's a Cisco web appliance, web security appliance, which uh, also the same for web security, uh, web-based threats. So when you go out to a site 
uh, the WSA will look at it and ensure that the site is doesn't have cross-site scripting, doesn't have drive-by infections, uh, isn't a uh, known um, blacklisted site. Those are all different ways. And the last item we'll talk about is cryptography. And this is really just how you ensure the confidentiality and integrity of your data. Um, now data integrity is, and in, we do that via hashing. In other words, we run an algorithm against a piece of data before you send it. And on the receiving end, you run the exact same algorithm. And if the two are not the same, then you know the data was changed in transit. Now, sometimes the data has changed just because of a network error. It's not always some nefarious hacker trying to do something. Uh, but in some cases, maybe, you know, we had it changed instead of paying Alex 100, we're paying Jeremy 1,000. Uh, and hashing would ensure that this was caught. So again, here we take the plain, tac, plain text message, whatever it happens to be, run it through MD5, and you get a 128-bit hash message. Once this plain text is received on the receiving end, you should be able to run it through the same hash function and get the exact same hash message. Same thing with SHA hashing. By the way, SHA is just a different uh, hashing algorithm versus MD5. Do not use MD5. It's not a very uh, good hashing algorithm anymore. And so SHA uh, is up to 512, really should be what we would use as much as possible. We also can use what is called um, HMAC algorithm hashing. In other words, we take a plain text message and a secret key, hash it, and then send it across, all right? And then once we do that, we send it across and then we put, actually we just take the secret key and we take the hash function and we put that hash with it. We send it across to the opposite side where it's received and we run the same secret key with the hash function and see if it matches. If it does, then we know that the data wasn't changed in transit. We also have the ability to do what's called data confidentiality. So hashing, again, hashing ensures integrity. Confidentiality is handled by either symmetric or asymmetric encryption. If you had, again, Security Plus at all, you understand this. But symmetric encryption is using the same key on both sides. It is faster and it's better to be used uh, with bulk data. The problem is you have to share that symmetric key before you share data. And so there's another method uh, which is called asymmetric encryption and also commonly known as public private key encryption. And we'll talk about that, but basically you've got a public key and a private key, and that allows you to share your public key with everyone. And then when they wanna communicate with you, they encrypt it with your public key and only your private key can decrypt it. So we have a symmetric en encryption example. So we've got a key on both sides. So we encrypt it, send it across, decrypt it. And in this case, this could be two network devices controlled by the same autonomous system or the same organization. And so they know the keys and they put the keys on the devices on both sides beforehand. Some different symmetrical encryption algorithms, uh, DES, triple DES, AES, SEAL, and RC ciphers, reverse ciphers. Um, AES is probably the standard most of us are using at this point, or SEAL. Um, then we have what is called asymmetric encryption. In this case, we take a, there's two ways to do this. If you wanna do data encryption, okay, so not authentication of a message, but data encryption, you need the public key of the individual you're gonna send information to. You take your text you wanna to send to them, you encrypt it with the public key. Now everybody has, for instance, if I wanted to do this, I'd give everybody my public key. So when they wanted to send something to me encrypted, they would take it, encrypt it with my public key, send it to me. At that point, only my private key can decrypt something encrypted with my public key. So this would ensure as long as my private key is secure, this would ensure that they could send me information and only I could decrypt it and it would only come to me. The negative here is you've got to have somebody to hand out these keys, okay? You've got to make sure the key stays secure, especially the private key, the public key you want to give to everybody. But this is how we handle encryption to um, websites. We take their public key, they give us their public key or their certificate, which also includes their public key. 
and then we take that and encrypt information that is sent to the website. And last but not least, there's a thing here called Diffie-Hellman, and this is where uh, they throw it in here because it's used a lot with VPNs, especially with IPsec VPNs. But it's used by um, host to create shared secret keys without ever actually sharing, sending the key across the connection between the two. And now it's it, it's a little difficult. And, and honestly, what you're looking at is you take the agreed on color, which is yellow, a secret color, and you get your private color. Then you exchange the, the different colors here, the private colors. And then you take Alice's secret color and Bob's private color, okay? It's also, both of them are, should actually be say, Bob's secret color, not private color, Bob's secret color. And you'll end up with the same final color. And it's all to deal with really big numbers and a mathematical equation, and they will finally both agree upon a final color or a final key without the key ever being sent. The only thing being sent are these private colors. Okay. And that should be Bob's secret color, not private color right there. So that's a mistake in the curriculum. Again, this is where you're getting into, you gotta have some pretty good math background to understand it. I always tell people it's two, two machines agree on some big numbers and then they agree on some more big numbers and then they end up with a, a shared big number that nobody knows um, except those two. And folks, that's the end of module three. Network Security Concepts, I hope it has been useful. It has been mostly a review of things you would find in a Security Plus class. So I uh, hope it's been useful and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon or day or morning or whenever you're listening to this.